Folks, a must-watch video each week is where Millennial Mike goes deep into the comment sections, finds the spicy, the great, sometimes mean comments, and asks me to react to them in real time. I have no idea which ones he brings. Uh, I'm entertained by this, so hopefully you are as well. So again, if you want to ask a question, uh, leave it in the comments. Maybe Millennial Mike will pick it up, and we'll talk about it on Sunday. So how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. And people do love this segment. We hear about it every time in the comment section. Um, I watch all your videos through the week and I go through oh the comment goodness. section of I all feel, your videos. I feel bad for you. That's a lot of videos. Well, maybe not all, but very close. I watch an awful I, lot. Of them. And, okay. uh, and as we go through the comment section, you know, as you mentioned, some people get a little heated, believe it or not. Uh, and some people have really genuine, sincere questions. They want to hear more about your opinion. You are an economist. You've been investing in the housing market for a very long time. Um, and so people want to hear what you have to say on certain issues to get that flushed out a little bit. So uh, today we're going to talk about a few different topics. Number one, housing is on fire. That's apparently something you're saying. Everything's on the up and up. I don't know if I've heard that one. Uh, still no price crash. Maybe uh, what, what people should do on taking losses. What if rates go to 10%? What are low appraisals going to do to the market? Those are some of the topics we're going to be talking about. So yeah, I started off today with a spicy comment. This one comes from Tebow Time 46 He says, great job. Keep pumping up the housing markets. Banks are failing. Home sales are down over 40%. Home prices are down year over year. But Mike here is saying housing is on fire. Mike, say no to drugs. Can you give us a little perspective? <laughs> Um, well, first and foremost, I've never said housing was on fire. Uh, in fact, I was one of the very first people uh, to say that housing is going to be flat for potentially the next decade. I don't consider a flat housing market on fire. Also, I called the 40% housing crash. So what you see now, whatever their name is, I called it early and warned you early. So a lot of my housing calls have been spot on. And um Frankly, uh, I take offense to that comment. I never said housing was on fire. I said, nationally speaking, we would be flat for five years, potentially a decade. We got a decade of appreciation in two years, and we got to pay up. Uh, I said affordability would be at record low. I highlighted that wage inflation would be a key element, as would time. Uh, there's plenty of prices to pay. I think real estate's in a depression. Uh, I think anytime you lose 40% of transactions, the commissions, the title fees, the inspections, uh, construction is down. Uh, I think housing's. I think housing's in a depression. But what everybody wants is price. That's just not how it works, people. Um, it's just not. And you're ignorant uh, for thinking that the more whining and louder that you scream, it's going to happen. You've been doing it for twelve years. I've told you what's happening, and now it is happening, and you guys don't like it. I've never said housing was on fire. You couldn't pay me to say that. I think a four to eight year boring period is by any stretch not on fire. So if I have to say it black and white, uh, housing is not on fire. Okay, well, that kind of leads us into our next couple of questions. So housing's not on fire. Um, and so another individual messages in and he says, okay, uh, this is from Terrence Scott 781. He says, new construction inventory increases, Airbnb inventory increases, recession is coming, interest rates are increasing at a fast pace, credit card debt at an all-time high, increasing mortgage and auto loan delinquencies, increasing layoffs. But Mike, no price crash in residential real estate? So you're going to say it's not on fire, but you're not going to say that there's a crash coming? Don't you think that's just sitting in the gray area too much? Uh, no, I don't. I talk a year at the time. Uh, and let's be clear. One of my 12 housing calls, which people can go look, go back and look on, we will have four year on year declines, nationally speaking. That's the first time I've said that. Or, well, when I created that list in, in January, we're going to have four months, probably uh, either February, March, April, May, or March, April, May, June, because last year, we had the crazy nonsense market. We are going to pay the price of that. Again, these are national discussions. And so, yeah, we're going to have four negative months. I called that in January. But when you go and look at December to December, I expect housing to be up 1% or 2%, a boring flat market. The problem that a lot of these folks don't get is housing moves a lot slower. 
Could we get a housing crash of 20% nominally speaking? Sure. But it will take years to build. Years. And I see no reason to believe that the Federal Reserve wouldn't immediately cut rates, put a floor on housing, and we're back to flat. I still see flat prices. I see transactions down 40% for years to come. Mm -hmm. You guys want a pricing crash? Because, you know, some kid in his mom's basement said it was coming. I don't believe it is. And lastly, let me be clear. I would like nothing better than a 75% crash in my market. I've got millions of dollars to deploy. I have access to millions more. I took advantage last time, and I would 10 exit this time. If I thought a housing crash, shoot, if I thought there was a 51% chance of a housing crash coming, I would scream it from the hills. And then lastly, I talk in year chunks because that's as far as my broken crystal ball looks. I have no idea how this complicated economy will be working or not working in two or three years. That's why I don't make housing calls that far out. I can look about a year in the future, given that I've looked at housing for 22 years. And more importantly, I've studied the consumer. I have conversations with a fortune and editor every Thursday. And the fact that there is interest rate lock-in and that families will make business decisions, that's why the housing market, the spring housing market, has no inventory. It's not coming. You can't have a housing crash if nobody sells their home. Right. Economics 101. <laughs> okay. And that leads us into our third and final question, sort of on this topic. And this one comes from Sugar Dre 123 Great name. Is your thesis that there's potential for pain everywhere except for residential housing? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I like how he phrased that because um, I guess I've not been clear. Residential housing is in a depression. I think I've said that a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Real estate transactions are down 40%. And now while you want it to be about price, a 40% crash in transactions is hundreds of millions and quite possibly billions of dollars not sloshing around in our economy. I would argue that residential real estate, not to mention construction, mm -hmm. mortgages, title, painters, blah, 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 is in a depression. So the fact that you whiny little bitch don't get your pricing drop and you say there's no, you're fucking missing the point. Residential real estate is in a depression. Jesus Christ. Sorry, I got a little animated. <laughs> this is what happens when I hit Mike with too many rapid fire. Yes. On the same Can topic. you give me some goodness between them and not keep <laughs> slapping me across the so, face? I will get mad. <laughs> Usually I save the lighthearted comment for the end of the interview. We do have one today, but we're going to get there in a little bit. All right. So Mike's explained to us why he doesn't think that your price, that your crash in prices is coming, even though people are complaining. However, some people have asked a couple of questions uh, that maybe could get us that crash in prices, maybe, at least based on some of the things you might have said in the past. So okay. uh, MD Part 2 asks, I would say, or says, I would say that housing values are totally dependent on what the Federal Reserve does with rates. If rates hit 10%, do you think that that would impact prices negatively? So this is all what if game, because at this point right. with what we know on March 12th, there's no chance rates hit 10%. Right. A week ago, there was maybe a 5% chance. There is a 0% chance rates hit 10% now. But let's just, let's just play with the question. If rates hit 10%, would housing prices crash? The answer is no. Where, what you have to say is, if interest rates hit 10% and stayed there for three years, would we have a price crash? Probably. If rates hit 10%, they're there for a weekend, and then they come down, who, what, who cares? Mm -hmm. If you know, When people say things like this, they need to add, what people don't get about residential real estate is the time element. Time. So I'll, I'll, I don't know if this is a question coming, but I'll give you another one. What if unemployment hit 10%? Well, again, unemployment hit 10% March of 2020. Did housing prices crash? Shit, unemployment hit 15% March of 2020. Did residential housing crash 50%? No. But if, if unemployment hit 15% for three years, 
that could be a problem. So everybody's missing the time element. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Has to get bad and stay bad for a consistent and Stay time. bad. Thank you. That's well said. Okay. Uh, well, one other question that somebody says, because advice that you give on folks right now is, hey, you know what? You need to get out there. You need to be learning what average is. You need to only buy great deals. You need to be making disrespectful offers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you get those disrespectful offers accepted, this individual's question right here, Lizard King 8388 says, if you buy that house for with a disrespectful offer of 275, then all the similar houses in the neighborhood are now also 275 because of the comp that you created in a declining market. Everybody there loses except for you. Or do you? Because if you wanted to sell, you're not going to get above 275 in a market that's declining. So, Mike, can you uh, explain to us, is that how real estate comps work? So I remember the video this came from, and actually I remember this comment. So I'll set it up because most people won't remember. So I talked about an example of two homes being worth 400 grand, like legit worth 400 grand. But for some reason, there's this one house where the owner has a situation where they have to fire sale it and they're willing to let it go for 275. Maybe it's off market. Maybe it's a friend of a friend. Who knows? But there is a recorded transaction of a 400K home selling for 275. So that's the setup for this video. This person doesn't know how appraisals work. An appraiser coming into that market, seeing homes sell for 400, 390, 405, and then this one at 275, they would mark that 275 as a distressed sell. And it will be excluded from an appraisal. One distressed sell will be excluded from an appraiser. It just is. So I, in this example that I gave, I would be able to pick up a 275 in the example, because I remember the outline, I would add 50 K in repairs, and then I would relist it at 400 grand and I would make 30 or 40 grand after, after uh, all costs. In fact, I have done this twice now with purchases I made around Christmas. So no, this person doesn't understand how appraisals work. They are, um, greatly misinformed right right yeah and you know kind of uh part of the point of the burr strategy even is to buy things significantly under market value i mean i bought a thirty thousand dollar house cash put twenty five thousand into it and then it appraised at one hundred and thirty four thousand six months later to the day so you know just because a house sells for less, there are things that get taken into consideration. So, uh, but maybe an honest question from someone who's just a newbie trying to figure things out. Um, okay, so you were interviewing Jason Pritchard this week, and you guys talked about taking losses. Julie Blass fifty nine four or fifty four ninety says it's a great episode. Towards the end, you guys were talking about taking losses. Do you think you lost more actual money for deals that you did, or lost more money from opportunities that you missed? Oh, I remember this question. What did I say? Do you remember what my response was? Uh, Your response, I didn't copy it in here, but your response was on the opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great insightful question. I remember because I I generally answer my, so first and foremost, I respond to all comments. Uh, The other thing I do, I don't know if people realize this, but I try to block all the stupid Bitcoin and crypto bots. I try. I do do my best, but I, I, I probably spend half an hour a day blocking crypto nonsense. Anyways, so I do respond. I, that's why they're short answers usually. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's usually the opportunity cost. Um, you know, but there was a great question. I don't usually think that way, right? I, I very rarely look backwards. I do the things I do. I, you know, I, t- I try to learn the lessons, but yeah, I think, I think there's always opportunity costs. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's tough I mean, when, when you look at things in hindsight. I, I definitely, when I think about the fact that I got started house hacking at 28, and the only reason I started at 28 was because I didn't know I could buy a house at 18 or 19 or 20, like Cody from Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. I just yeah. didn't know. So I gave up a decade. I could have been investing in real estate. And that opportunity cost, I know I've heard you talk about before how yeah. you had known about house hacking. You would have done it different. Yeah, my, my I, I'm lucky enough to be sitting here at 50 with very few financial regrets, but one of them I've admitted and, I, and I'll own until I'm dead is I didn't house hack a fourplex in the Silicon Valley in 1992. Can you, my, my net worth would be 
double or triple what it is today simply by that one decision in in 92. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, missed opportunities. But hindsight is 2020. You can really only uh, change things moving forward. So uh, here's an interesting question that only you could answer because unfortunately no. I'm not retired. Uh, and this uh, was a question about retired. This comes from Brian Beck, 32. He said, I'd be very interested to hear what you and the rest of the three amigos discuss how to find medical insurance when retiring from your W-2 job. What have you done? I remember this question as well. It's another good one. And um, thankfully, I don't have a great answer for you here. I think most people want me to talk about how I shopped around for this and that and all that nonsense. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I wanted to keep the same doctor. Uh, I wanted the same insurance. I wanted the platinum coverage. I didn't shop around. I didn't look elsewhere. I called up who had my insurance, asked for a quote. It's ridiculously expensive. And I pay it every month. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not a great resource for finding the best health care or the cheapest way or all those things. I, I I didn't waste a second of time thinking about it. I got a quote. It, it's most people would think it's crazy. It uh, It doesn't even resonate with me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, they may have to save that for another three amigos topic. Then yes. you guys can kick that. Yes, not, I don't have a great answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, question here from Coop Tech, who's been asking great questions the last couple of weeks. We've had a few from them. Uh, they said how, they want to know. They said thank you, team. Uh, thank you. Are you open to sharing seed? It, excuse me. They want to know how much seed capital you used mm. when you started your first five years, your second five years, your third five years, not including cash out refinances. They're trying to figure out how much of their W-2 income they need to save to invest into real estate in the first five years of investing. So I used 40,000 bucks, probably, yeah, the first five years that would have been, yeah, 40 grand. That's all I had. Yeah. Over the first 10 years, I probably used 100K of my W-2, but the first five years was 40. So I guess that means the next five years was 60. But that's all the W-2 money I, I put in and, and have obviously since taken out a lot more than that. So this is a good question. And uh, no offense, Mike, I love you, but your first five years investing in real estate was a little while ago. I think was, Did you just call me old? <laughs> I, I was being nicer than Cody, who just blatantly said it. Yeah. But <laughs> at your live event, when you almost had to punch him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> slap him, slap him, slap him. Slap. Yes, exactly. Um, my first five years is ending very soon here. I'm in my first five years right now and about to end. For my first house hack, uh, a duplex in Seattle that I purchased in 2018, I got in with a 5% down conventional loan, $450,000 purchase price. I was able to get in all in closing costs included about $32,000. That was my first property. That yeah. allowed me to save and save and save and then buy more properties from there. And from there, it's going to be market dependent. If I'd stayed here in the Seattle area, I would have had to save 20% for down payments on a lot of properties around here. It's a little pricey or jump yeah. around with house hacks. So I decided to invest in the Midwest. I average about $15,000 a down payment on a property in the Midwest, and I've purchased seven more since then. So I'll let you do the math because I'm not going to try to do that in my head. But it's one, there one, seven, ways... times one, seven times 15 is 105. Appreciate you, Mike. You're the man. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, but that was what I experienced in my first five years. Okay. Now we got a question that has come from the Instagram section, people have messaged me on Instagram asking me to get your thoughts on the Silicon Valley bank implosion. Now, I know you did an entire video on that recently. So I would encourage people to just move towards that um, because your kind of final thoughts in that video was it's potentially going to be a crisis, but not a crisis like 2008, not quite as bad as that crisis. Um, but people are wondering, I, 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 it's going to be a different crisis. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to put magnitude on it. But sure, sure. A different type of crisis. Okay. Uh -huh. So the question that I've kind of heard echoed to me a few times is that as Silicon Valley Bank invested into treasury bonds or into bonds, and then rates went up, the bonds got devalued. Couldn't that same problem apply to many other banks? Don't lots of other banks also invest in bonds? Absolutely. Uh, what? So so let's step back for this. So first off, what, what happened at Silicon Valley Bank from a balance sheet perspective um, is happening across financial institutions. So basically what happened over the last two years is a lot of these institutions got a lot of client money. 
Okay. Banks pay a rate, then they invest that ideally at a rate above what they're paying clients. As we all know, over the last two years, the Federal Reserve has taken rates up 450 basis points and they're not done, which if you know bonds, when rates go up, values go down. Mm -hmm. uh, in financial institutions, they do one of two things. They can mark to market or they can hold to maturity. Every financial institution on the planet has marked their bonds hold to maturity. What happened at Silicon Valley Bank is somebody screamed fire in a crowded movie theater and everybody ran to the exits. In 24 hours, because somebody screamed fire, $42 billion was extracted from a bank, which is 20% of their value. No wow. bank on the planet, mm -hmm. no bank on the planet could survive a 24-hour a uh, run uh, of that magnitude. None. Okay. JP Morgan, wow. Citigroup, all of them. They don't have that. They would be foolish to keep 20% of their investments in cash. So what happened at Silicon Valley Bank is the first $14 billion, which was about 7% of capital, was gone. That was the cash they had. Then they had to raise capital to meet client demands. They wanted their money back. So they were forced to sell mark hold to maturity assets today, which meant they had to take a haircut. And they took a $2 billion loss, which was the spark that made the person scale, scream fire. Mm -hmm. And we just saw Jimmy Stewart, the wonderful life bank run right. in real life. Right. It. Silicon Valley Bank, without somebody screaming fire, probably survives. They hold to maturity. They raise a little capital. They give some preferred shares. They're still around on Monday. But when you lose 20% of your... Because, again, they're worth $200 billion. $42 billion of it comes out in a 24-hour period. You're fucked. It's over. Done. Right. So that's what happened. Yeah, there was no... Jimmy Stewart or George Bailey to sit there and start handing out his own personal cash to people in that amount. No, no. I like that reference. It's actually my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> oh, there you go. Awesome. I didn't know. Okay. That. Uh, the last two questions that we have, um, and this is one of them's from uh, Mr. Balloon Pimp. Interesting name. Uh, he says, you guys should set up an email for people to submit their questions. That way, Mr. Zuber uh, doesn't have any warning of the questions. So, Mike, if there's an email people could reach out to you at, what is that so they can get their questions answered? Actually, they should email you if I'm not going to get – they should email you. So what is your email? Because I I agree. I, and I just so you know, I don't know what these questions are. So right. it's, it's already that way. People, so people to know out there, um, I go through the comment section. I mean, yeah, if it's in the comments, Mike actually has read the question, but he gets – thousands of comments and doesn't know which ones I'm going to pick. So I really do spring yeah. these on him. You know what? You um, should just DM you on Instagram. You don't have to give your what, email. That is what they should do. They should DM me on Instagram at millennial Mike. Uh, people send us videos they want us to react to. We're going to do George Gammon next year in a few minutes. Uh, people send me amalgam questions about like Silicon Valley Bank and I kind of create the question um, or direct questions. Anything you want, just send to me on Instagram or leave it in the comment section. I will find it. Now we have our very last question here's a fun one mike mr zuber if you had the choice would you rent to superman or spider-man who would make the better tenant uh i'm gonna go superman uh again and this is that uh, <laughs> basically because my recollection of spider-man is he's a kid he probably doesn't have a credit score no. he's in high school i thought so he doesn't yep. have a good paying job so i'm gonna guess superman working in a newspaper uh, is a better credit risk, but that's just I uh, ten seconds of thinking. Well, if you uh, remember the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies from when I was a kid, there was actually a scene in there where he gets in an argument with his landlord because he can't make ah. his rent payments because he's young. Oh, there so you go. that was the right answer. Anyways, that was, that was all the questions for today. We do have a video of George Gamma we're going to react to next. That'll be in a separate video. Thanks for having me. Thank you, buddy. Take care. Again, folks, uh, DM Millennial Mike on Instagram. Uh, if you don't want me to see the comments, uh, which is totally fine by me. Thanks.